Um, so yes, thank you all. I'd just like to echo those sentiments. Um, uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to speak uh, before you all. So th thank you to all the, the patients, the families, and the, the organizers for this meeting. Um, so a little bit of background about me. So uh, I am coming from Houston. Uh, I'm at UT. I was previously at Baylor, so I'm, I'm not uh, affiliated with them anymore. But uh, but now I'm, I'm working with uh, Dr. Milowitz, um, uh, exploring some of the the genetics of uh, of vascular diseases, including uh, ACTA2 and SMDS uh, specifically. So for the next uh, you know 45 minutes uh, or so, I'm going to be talking about the work that uh, that Dr. Milowitz has has really done over the last uh, 12, 13 years to uh, to define SMDS uh, and um, and then ex expand the phenotype, and then most recently um, uh, her work uh, developing potential uh, therapies. So uh, I'll go ahead and get started. Okay, so I, I don't need to uh, tell you all uh, about the, the major complications associated with SMDS, but um, uh, the ones, uh, you know, that, that I'm going to focus uh, on are the, uh, the cerebrovascular phenotype, so the, the early onset uh, strokes due to the moya moya like uh, problems. Um, we know about the, the thoracic aortic aneurysms and dissections, uh, as well as the, the problems with the lungs. Um, so I know we're going to hear a lot about the, the aortic disease and, and uh, about the lung disease uh, later, and so I, I won't talk about those specifically, but, um, uh, but today's uh, talk is going to be uh, about the, the moya moya like phenotype, the cerebrovascular disease. Um, uh, you know, SMDS does uh, certainly affect other systems, including the, the gut, the bladder, the eyes, uh, et cetera, but, but for, uh, for this talk, I'm going to be focused on the, the stroke um, and the, the moya moya like phenotype. So, uh, so as uh, was stated earlier, um, uh, Dr. Milowitz has been uh, very active in, in uh, the SMDS uh, condition. Uh, you know, she, her paper from I think this was 2010 uh, was the first that defined uh, SMDS uh, uh, due to these de novo ACTA2 mutations, the R179 uh, mutation, and uh, and she's uh, she and her lab members have uh, have expanded uh, the knowledge uh, about uh, SMDS, and this this paper came out in uh, I think this was 2018. Uh, and it was led by Ellen Regalado, who uh, who was a past member of Dr. Milowitz's group, um, and she defined kind of the natural history of uh, of SMDS as well as some of the management recommendations. So, uh, so this was about five years ago, and we've uh, we've learned certainly um, a, a lot since then. And uh, uh, some of the uh, other authors on this uh, paper here are are in the room as well. So it's been a very collaborative effort. So these are just some of the uh, the other uh, papers uh, that uh, have come out of the, the Milowitz lab uh, focused on ACTA2 and specifically SMDS. So I mentioned the original 2010 paper that defined uh, SMDS, um, but then uh, subsequent papers that described the, the, um, the, the gut uh, phenotype, the further defined the cerebrovascular phenotype, uh, the eye findings, um, and then uh, uh, some papers describing the, the molecular defects associated with specific ACTA2 mutations. Um, and then uh, I mentioned the, the, rec the uh, re recommendation paper, the management recommendation paper. Um, and then more recently in 2022, uh, a paper uh, that was uh, by one of the, the MD-PhD students uh, really expanding the, the, the ACTA2 uh, phenotype to include uh, other, other mutations. Um, and then most recently, um, uh, Dr. Kelly Quarler, one of the uh, other members of uh, Dr. Milowitz's lab, uh, has been doing a lot of work uh, describing um, really the, the underlying uh, kind of molecular defects uh, that give rise to SMDS, um, uh, specifically related to uh, smooth muscle cell differentiation. So I'm actually going to be talking quite a bit about that because it's relevant to, uh, to the development of uh, potential therapies. So what causes M SMDS? So I don't need to tell you all that. Uh, it's due to uh, specific, uh, a specific mutation in ACTA2, this R179, so arginine 179, uh, to a, a different amino acid. Um, and ACTA2 is the gene, and it produces a specific protein. So that's the um, smooth muscle uh, alpha actin uh, that's, that's present in smooth muscle cells. Um, and so... 
just taking a step backwards, what are smooth muscle cells? So, you know, these are these are uh, muscle cells uh, that are present in a specific type of muscle, uh, smooth muscle, uh, that's present in uh, in all sorts of different structures. Um, but in this um, in this context, we're mainly talking about uh, the smooth muscle cells that are in the walls of uh, arteries, and um, and specifically, they're in that um, these smooth muscle, smooth muscle cells are in the uh, the middle layer of um, of the aortic wall. And recall that that uh, wall is composed of three distinct layers. So there's the inner intima, uh, which is actually what's in contact with the blood. Um, and then you have this kind of thick, um, thick medial layer um, that contains different proteins, um, but mostly is filled with these smooth muscle cells. And those muscle cells uh, contract in response to the pulse pressure that's coming through. Um, and then you have this outer adventitial layer. So uh, in, in the normal, um, in a normal healthy vessel, these three uh, layers are, are distinct and uh, they, um, they you know, construct the, the wall of, of the, the artery. And, uh, and then uh, there's a channel um, open uh, that we call the lumen uh, through which blood flows. Uh, but in, in individuals that have uh, the moya moya um, like phenotype uh, in SMDS patients, uh, what we think is happening is that these smooth muscle cells in that thick medial layer, that they are um, uh, proliferating and migrating out of the media uh, into the lumen. So uh, forming what we call a neo intima or new intima. And if enough of those cells migrate out into the lumen, uh, eventually it can block off um, uh, the the flow through, uh, through that vessel, uh, giving rise to ischemia and eventually stroke. So, um, so that gives us an idea of uh, you know, what we can try to target with different therapies, uh, you know, basically to try to reduce that, that migration of those smooth muscle cells out of the, the medial layer. So what is different about um, the ACTA2 alterations that cause SMDS? Well, um, we know that uh, different ACTA2 mutations give rise to, to all sorts of different uh, uh, phenotypes, um, uh, which were uh, described in, in this paper that I'll talk about uh, in a little bit more detail uh, from, from our group. Um, but it seems that uh, in terms of the, the full SMDS um, uh, phenotype, it's due to specifically to these R179 mutations. And, uh, there are now uh, five different mutations. So from the arginine 179 to some other amino acid, uh, we've now identified five different ones associated with, uh, with SMDS. And so this is really the, the main uh, highlight from that paper um, describing the, the expanded uh, ACTA2 mutations and, and their phenotypes. And, um, and what you see is that um, there, there, are, there are many different uh, ACTA2 mutations um, that have various degrees of overlap with the SMDS phenotype. Um, but it, it does appear that in terms of uh, the most severe phenotype, so including you know, the PDA, the, the uh, moya moya like uh, cerebrovascular disease, the aortic disease, pulmonary disease, et cetera, that uh, that seems to be uh, found uh, mainly with these arginine 179 mutations. Um, so, but there is overlap with, with other uh, mutations as well. Okay, so how does a single genetic uh, alteration cause such diverse and diffuse vascular disease? Um, and so that's something that, that we're very interested in, uh, in understanding. And uh, our hypothesis is that, uh, that in, in the vessels, it, it has to do with the size of, of the vessels that are involved. Um, in the large, uh, the large arteries like the aorta, um, that the, the decreased smooth muscle cell contraction that results from uh, from those ACTA2, from that ACTA2 mutation, uh, uh, leads to development of the aortic aneurysms and the risk for uh, dissection. Uh, however, in smaller arteries, uh, so like those um, uh, in the the brain uh, the, that uh, supply the blood supply to the brain, um, we think that the the problem is different. That it's it's actually the increased proliferation and migration of these smooth muscle cells, as, as I was talking about earlier, uh, out of the, the medial layer into the, the lumen and then giving rise to um, uh, occlusions, which, uh, which lead to stroke and the, the moya moya-like uh, phenotype that we see with SMDS. So 
Um, so different size vessels uh, and different underlying mechanisms, but the same, uh, same mutation that's giving rise to both. So how do we uh, in the Milowitz lab approach studying SMDS? Well, we've developed uh, several different systems. So uh, we have uh, some cellular uh, systems as well as some, uh, an animal model that, that we use. And so uh, up here on the, uh, the upper right, uh, this is where we take uh, uh, cells from a patient, from an SMDS patient, uh, typically the skin fibroblasts. And we do something called de-differentiating them. So taking them back into uh, what's called a progenitor stem cell, uh, which can then um, uh, which can then be differentiated into uh, any any type of uh, other cell. In this case, uh, we we differentiate them into smooth muscle cells, and so we can uh, we can perform experiments uh, on on those cells. Uh, we've developed an SMDS mouse model uh, where we knock we have knocked in a the R one seven nine mutation uh, specifically into smooth muscle cells uh, in these mice. Um, and then we can take uh, the aortic smooth muscle cells um, uh, from uh, from the, the mouse or, or from the uh, from uh, our patients, and we can uh, we can grow them out in culture um, uh, and and study them in vitro. So we have uh, you know these multiple systems that that we use to to better understand the underlying mechanism uh, of SMDS and to help us. Uh, uh, evaluate potential therapies for uh, uh, for for the condition. So uh, so what is the underlying defect uh, that's that's causing SMDS? Uh, so what what does the ACTA two R one seven nine mutation actually do? So we could talk about that uh, for a long time. It could be the the topic of a separate session entirely. Um, but this is the work that uh, that Dr. Uh, Kelly Quartler in uh, in Dr. Milowitz's lab has really been focused on. Um, and she's done really some some tremendous work uh, uh, trying to uh, elucidate that that underlying mechanism. Um, and she has made some some really uh, great um, uh, findings. Uh, the first finding is that the uh, the actin that's produced uh, in these smooth muscle cells, so it's smooth muscle alpha actin, um, it's actually produced in uh, in the cytosol, so uh, within the cell. Um, but in normal cells, so non-SMDS uh, smooth muscle cells, that actin uh, gets uh, moved into the nucleus, uh, where it has some uh, important function, which uh, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, but what's interesting is that uh, in the uh, mutant cells, uh, the, those that have the R179 mutation, that actin uh, remains uh, remains in the cell or well, remains outside of the nucleus. It doesn't move into the nucleus. So, um, so whatever function uh, it's having, it's supposed to have in the nucleus uh, is not occurring because, uh, because it's, not, it's not physically there. And remember that the, the nucleus is actually, it's, it's kind of the, you know, the, uh, the, well, it's the center of the cell, it's the command center that, uh, that gives the guidance uh, to the cell for how it's supposed to function. So the fact that, acta, uh, that actin uh, goes into the nucleus, uh, you know, suggests that it has some uh, important function uh, going on there. And uh, another observation that she made was that um, that these mutant cells uh, with the actin uh, that doesn't go into the nucleus, that they actually um, uh, they're not actually differentiated uh, completely. So they they show what's called incomplete differentiation. And and so what does that mean? So, um, so as I as I mentioned earlier, um, you know, cells in in early development they they begin as these progenitor stem cells that can become uh, any any cell type, um, and uh, and then through differentiation they become uh, their final uh, cell type. In this case, uh, smooth muscle cells, um, and the stem cells that are uh, located in or that go on to uh, to be part of the ascending aorta and the blood vessels of the brain. They're what we call neural crest uh, stem cells, but in um, in the mutant cells, those that have the the ACTA two R one seven nine mutation, uh, where the actin doesn't go into the nucleus, they actually show uh, markers uh, that they they have a lot more in common with these stem cells, so, so they don't undergo that full di differentiation. Uh, instead, they kind of get hijacked and become uh, this altered smooth muscle cell. And they also show evidence uh, of uh, that show findings similar to stem cells where they have increased uh, proliferation and migration. 
So, um, so all of those kind of observations and findings uh, have been very uh, important in, in us uh, to develop potential therapies uh, that might uh, reduce that, uh, that migration of the smooth muscle cells out of the, the medial layer into the intima. Um, so basically targeting uh, that differentiation that, that's incomplete in these smooth muscle cells. So, uh, so one of the things that we, um, that we observed uh, in, this is called a migration assay, uh, is that uh, these smooth muscle cells from the mutants are very active. They, they move a lot, uh, they, they migrate a lot. And that, that's what uh, we think was, was happening. And that's the, the pictures I was showing you earlier with the, the migration of those cells out of the medial layer into the intima. But this was a way of actually quantifying that. So uh, with that, this assay, when you look at control smooth muscle cells, there's some movement, um, some migration, but it's, it's pretty, pretty small. And that's what you see here at the top uh, right. Um, but in the, the mutant cells, the, smooth, the SMDS uh, cells, uh, they move all over the place. So they're, they're migrating uh, to, to a much higher level. And so that, uh, that appears to be consistent with what we're thinking uh, is going on in the, the wall of these um, uh, blood vessels. And so specifically, um, uh, what we think is happening um, is that, uh, like I said, those, uh, those smooth muscle cells that normally should just reside within the wall of the, uh, the, the artery are actually moving um, out into the lumen. And this is a cross-section of an artery from someone with Moya Moya disease where we see, uh, where we should see uh, an opening in the middle, uh, an open lumen that allows blood to pass through it. But uh, instead we see the entire space filled with these, uh, these uh, fibroblasts, which you can recognize by those little purple dots. So those are all fibroblasts. And so, you know, that the fact that there's, uh, they go into the lumen and block flow, that leads to ischemia and, uh, and stroke. Um, and what you also uh, do not see here is evidence of kind of athero atherosclerotic disease. So you don't see cholesterol plaques, you don't see inflammation um, uh, and, and other features of, of more typical athero atherosclerotic disease that is the most common cause of strokes. Uh, so it seems that in this uh, in this condition, that the the issue is that these smooth muscle cells uh, these are are filling the lumen and and thereby blocking off blood flow. So, uh, in our uh, mouse model, when we did imaging, um, uh, we actually did not find any frank uh, occlusions like we see in in many SMDS patients. And so, to try to induce that uh, moya moya like. Uh, phenotype, we did something called uh, carotid artery injury. So uh, in this, we, we ligate or we tie off the left carotid artery. Um, and, then, um, and then below that, uh, you'll get stasis of blood um, and formation of a blood clot. And then eventual, um, uh, you get uh, thickening of the, the, the arterial wall and then movement of smooth muscle cells and blood cells into the lumen. But then over the, the course of a few weeks, uh, that, uh, that kind of resolves on its own. So those, those uh, smooth muscle cells go away um, and, and you're left with uh, a, thickened, uh, a thickened artery, but uh, an open one. You might have some remnant uh, blood cells, but for the most part, um, the, uh, the uh, vessel is, is open. And that's what happens in a normal um, uh, mouse. So not one with SMDS. Um, but uh, when we do the same injury, carotid artery injury to our SMDS mouse, uh, we find something quite different. So here on the left, uh, that's again uh, what we see uh, in, um, in the control mouse, so the unaffected mouse, that thickened uh, uh, carotid artery, um, but it's open otherwise. Uh, but in our SMDS mouse model, uh, we note two things, uh, that the diameter, the size of that uh, blood vessel is much, much larger. Uh, but really more importantly is, is that it's filled uh, entirely with these smooth muscle cells. Um, and so you don't have any, uh, any lumen anymore. So there's no, there's no channel through which blood could potentially flow. So, um, so this combination of our SMDS model, mouse model with carotid injury uh, kind of recapitulates the, uh, what we're seeing in, uh, in, in patients with SMDS. Uh, one other fact uh, or finding is that in about 20% of the, the SMDS mice that, that undergo this carotid injury, 
um, uh, about 20% of them die from strokes, which is in contrast to the, the uh, control mice, the, the unaffected mice, uh, where none of them uh, die from strokes. So, um, okay, so that, that all gave us some ideas about how to potentially um, uh, you know, develop a, a treatment. Um, and really what, what we wanted to do was find a way uh, of reducing that abnormal migration of smooth muscle cells out of the medial layer into the lumen uh, to form that, that neo-intima. So we wanted to prevent that. And, um, and so based on everything I've said before, um, we think that it's, it's likely related to the fact that these, uh, these smooth muscle cells are, are incompletely differentiated. Um, and if we just uh, kind of step back a little bit, we know that in basic cell biology that, that undifferentiated stem cells, they, they use uh, glucose as their main energy source uh, through a process called glycolysis. Um, and that's uh, in contrast to uh, differentiated cells uh, that use uh, a different process called oxidative phosphorylation or oxphos to generate energy. And that's a much more efficient um, uh, process but, um, but these more undifferentiated uh, stem cells um, uh, use glucose as their main energy source through a process called uh, glycolysis. We also know that if you just take uh, uh, stem cells that are using uh, glucose mainly, um, but then force them into uh, using oxidative phosphorylation, that process by itself uh, can induce those cells to then differentiate. So, uh, so we we thought about trying to do th that with with these cells, these smooth muscle cells that um, that exhibit uh, kind of you know they're hypodifferentiated uh, and and exhibit increased proliferation pro proliferation and migration, but that uh, if we can kind of induce them to uh, to do ox more oxidative phosphorylation, then uh, perhaps that could help. And what we uh, showed here on the right, this this is what's called a seahorse assay, and um, um, it measures the level of oxidative phosphorylation and glycolysis occurring in, uh, in cells. And what we found is that, um, uh, what, what we had hoped to find is that um, the, uh, the mutant smooth cells actually have decreased uh, oxidative phosphorylation uh, compared to wild type or, or normal cells, and they have increased um, glycolysis uh, compared to wild type or normal cells. So, uh, so they are, in fact, um, uh, acting metabolically more like these stem cells um, uh, that use gl uh, glucose as their primary energy source, and that by you know uh, perhaps inducing them into oxphos, uh, we could get them to differentiate more and then uh, reduce that abnormal migration that uh, that has been occurring. So how do we get it? How do we how do we do that? How do we encourage or induce cells to uh, to do more oxidative phosphorylation? Well. There are a number of different ways. Um, uh, one of the most well studied uh, is uh, giving a um, uh, kind of the precursors to oxidative phosphorylation. So, in, in effect, kind of giving the cells the ingredients that they need to uh, to then uh, perform oxidative phosphorylation. And one of the things that uh, that uh, can be done uh, or can do that is something called nicotinic uh, riboside, which is a vitamin B three analog. And, uh, and it's a precursor, one of these ingredients for, uh, for oxidative phosphoryl phosphorylation. So, uh, so that was one potential strategy to, to try to induce these cells to, to undergo uh, oxphos and then uh, differentiate. And so this is the kind of the, the main takeaway slide in terms of what, what our, our goal was. Uh, and uh, so taking these um, let me see if I can use the mouse here. So taking these, uh, these more uh, uh, undifferentiated smooth muscle cells uh, that have the R179 mutation. Uh, so these are, they're very glycolytic. So they use glucose as their energy source. They're very proliferative and migratory. And we think that that's likely contributing uh, to the moyamoya-like uh, disease phenotype. But our hope was that by giving them NR, nicot uh, nicotinamide riboside, um, that uh, that would encourage them or induce them to switch from using glycolysis to using oxidative phosphorylation. And so here at the bottom, that would take them from being this in this hypodifferentiated, proliferative and migratory state uh, that then gives rise to the, the, uh, uh, the stenosis of, of those uh, blood vessels 
to a more differentiated and quiescent state uh, where, uh, where the lumen remains open because those smooth muscle cells uh, don't migrate and stay within, within the lumen. So this was really our, our main uh, uh, hypothesis. And then um, we found uh, in, in our cellular model that, uh, that NR uh, does restore the mitochondrial function in the, the mutant mice. Um, so uh, it actually increases oxphos in both uh, uh, normal or wild type cells as well as the, the mutant cells. Uh, but that was encouraging um, that, uh, that giving NR to these, uh, these mutants with muscle cells that have the R179 mutation, that, uh, that does induce them uh, to uh, switch uh, over to oxidative phosphorylation. Os oxidative phosphorylation. Uh, in addition, um, uh, we also could quantify uh, it, the effect that that had on cell migration. And we found here uh, the, the mutant cells, the, the, the uh, SMDS cells are the ones in blue. And what you can see here is that uh, at baseline, uh, without any treatment, uh, the, the, the bar is very high. Uh, that's representing the, the high migration that's occurring. So this is, remember those pictures that I showed you before, this is kind of a quantification of that. But that uh, when you give NR to these uh, mutant cells, uh, that migration comes down uh, significantly, almost to the level of the wild type or normal cells uh, that you see here in gray. So that was very encouraging. Um, and then what about uh, in the, the, the mice, the SMDS mice that, that undergo this, uh, this uh, carotid artery injury? Well, uh, we found uh, basically similar findings. Um, uh, up here on the uh, upper left is the survival curve uh, on NR treatment. And uh, here at the top, you, there's a red and a black uh, bar. And these are the, the, the normal mice, so the wild type mice that do not have SMDS. Uh, and when you, when you treat them with NR or, you, uh, or they're not treated, uh, they have 100% survival as expected. Um, here in blue, these are the, the uh, SMDS uh, mice. Um, that are uh, just given what we call a vehicle, or it, it's basically untreated, it's just water. Um, and uh, we see that about 20% of them die, as, a, as I mentioned earlier, uh, from, uh, from stroke. But in the, uh, the mutant mice cells uh, that are treated with NR, we get uh, a, significant, uh, a reduction in the uh, the immediate death due to stroke. So going from 20% down to around 5%. Uh, so that's, a, that's a, a nice uh, improvement uh, just in the, the immediate death due to, due to strokes. And then when you look at the actual blood vessels, uh, the, the carotid artery cross-section from these uh, mice, uh, this is what we saw earlier. Uh, in the, the wild-type mice, you have the thickened artery, but it's open otherwise. Uh, and then on the right, uh, you have that, you know, dilated, uh, but completely full of smooth muscle cells um, uh, vessel. But when you treat um, these, uh, the, the mice with NR uh, uh, and, and do the injury just as before, um, you still get that dilation of, of the, the, the artery, but, uh, but it's, it's uh, open otherwise. So, um, so this was very encouraging and, uh, and shows that, um, that potentially this might be uh, a, a, an option for treatment. And this is just some of the quantification here uh, showing that in the, again, the, the mutant mice cells here are in blue, that uh, the occlusion uh, for uh, going from untreated to treated uh, decreases significantly. Uh, almost, again, almost to the, the level of the, the wild type mice. Um, and then here to the right, it, it shows that the, the diameter, the size of that uh, artery uh, remains the same, um, which is to be expected, but, uh, but at least it's open now. So it's not occluded. So uh, I, I, you know, hopefully that will lead to, uh, to improved circulation and, and a decrease in strokes. And then when we uh, do some imaging uh, using micro CT, uh, here on the top, these are wild type mice that are untreated. These are the, the SMDS mice uh, that are untreated. And then here are the, the, the SMDS mice that are treated with NR. Um, we see uh, a, a few things in, in the, the untreated um, uh, mutant mice. Uh, there's a bit of um, straightening and, and some narrowing of, of uh, the blood vessels in the brain. This is a, 
uh, the circle of Willis uh, that provides the circulation to, to the brain. Uh, but we see some, some straightening of those vessels um, and some narrowing. But uh, when we treat with NR, um, uh, we see uh, kind of some resolution of that, of that narrowing. And when we actually uh, quantify that, uh, that's that's what we're seeing as well. And this is very recent uh, results. So uh, we're going to continue looking at this, but it does seem to show evidence that when we actually look at the imaging and measure the sizes of these uh, these blood vessels in the brain after treatment with NR, that uh, the narrowing does seem to uh, decrease. So basically the they're they're more open uh, for blood flow. Um, another finding uh, is that in the SMDS, uh, mice, uh, they develop some collateral circulation um, uh, called uh, leptomen leptomeningeal uh, collaterals uh, th that uh, they grow and um, likely as a compensatory mechanism because the, the other circulation that normally supplies the blood supply to the brain um, uh, is compromised. Um, and so the, 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 the mice compensate by um, uh, by using these these alternative uh, blood vessels, this, these comp compensatory um, uh, blood vessels, uh, but that in when we treat with uh, NR, uh, that um, remodeling uh, kind of uh, those collaterals uh, don't develop to the same degree, and it's likely because uh, they're no longer it's no longer needed because the the normal circulation is more open, uh, and thus uh, these collaterals don't have to develop. Um, so what about some other strategies to try to uh, induce these smooth muscle cells to go from glycolysis, glycolysis to oxidative phosphorylation? So I, I mentioned the NR, uh, which again is, is a, a, a precursor uh, to oxphos. Uh, but another strategy would be to actually um, uh, deprive the cells of the glucose that, uh, that they, they want to use. And that kind of forces them into using oxidative phosphorylation. And, uh, and we can do that by uh, using something called galactose, uh, which is just substitutes for glucose, but, um, but it, it effectively is, is uh, depriving the cells of that glucose energy source and forcing them into using oxphos. And when we do that, um, we find that uh, indeed the, uh, the uh, oxidative phosphorylation increases um, in, uh, in these mutant cells. Uh, and the glycolysis uh, goes down, uh, which, which we would expect. And then just like I showed uh, before with the NR, we also see that migration decreases. Um, this, this graph looks almost identical to, uh, to the other one, showing that the, the migration uh, goes from uh, very, being very high in these untreated mutant cells uh, to, uh, to nearly the level of, uh, of wild type cells uh, when you deprive them of, of glucose. So that's an, another... Uh, strategy. So what about the bladder and gut? So this is something that, that's very new, new results and, and something that we're exploring uh, more in depth now. But the major actin isoform in the gut and bladder smooth muscle cells is uh, something called gamma-2 actin, which is encoded by the ACTG2 gene, so a different gene. Um, and we, we have found that in explanted aortic uh, smooth muscle cells that gamma-2 actin is expressed, but at, at fairly low levels. But in the uh, in the in normal smooth muscle cells, but in the the SMDS uh, mice, uh, there's almost uh, zero expression. Um, but that uh, restricting glucose, uh, so depriving the the cells of, of glucose by giving them galactose, it significantly increases the gamma two actin levels um, uh, that were very low before. And so we're we're planning to to delve uh, further into this uh, into this the intestinal and bladder phenotype and to better understand why. Um, why uh, act, uh, act, act, smooth muscle alpha actin um, would have an effect on, uh, on this gamma-2 actin. Again, it's probably related to the fact that that actin is supposed to go into the nucleus and have some uh, function likely related to differentiation of, of the cell, um, but that's to be uh, uh, explored. So in terms of the research that, that we're doing, so um, one of the things that, that's very important is to confirm that the long-term uh, treatment with NR or any of these other potential uh, treatments uh, doesn't worsen the aortic or pulmonary uh, disease uh, while improving the, the cerebrovascular disease. And um, uh, what I didn't show here is that we have some, some long-term uh, data in mice for the aortic phenotype 
uh, on the order of like four to five months that shows that uh, NR does not seem to be uh, worsening the, the aortic disease. So the diameters are staying uh, pretty much the same. Um, uh, and so we're going to be looking at pulmonary disease uh, as well. Uh, we're, we're applying uh, to the FDA and our IRB uh, for approval to, to begin our clinical trial for NR. And actually, just a couple of weeks ago, we got uh, approval from the uh, from the FDA uh, to go ahead. So now we're waiting on the IRB. And so our hope is that in the next couple of months, we can begin our preclinical trial, where we will uh, have a, a small number of SMDS patients come down to Houston. Um, to, to undergo some imaging, so like PET, CT, echo, do some blood work, um, and then we'll start them on uh, uh, NR and, and then bring them back after uh, two months, uh, repeat the, the imaging and blood work in order to, uh, to get some baseline data that will then allow us to design our full trial where we'll have more patients and we'll be able to, to uh, assess uh, the effect of NR and potentially other treatments on the cerebrovascular phenotype, the aortic phenotype, the lungs, and other phenotypes. So, uh, so that's all uh, to come. Uh, we're also actively looking for other therapeutics. So I mentioned, you know, the the glucose restriction. So, uh, you know, that's akin to like a low carbohydrate uh, diet. Um, uh, you know, something like a ketogenic diet. So that's something we're going to be trying uh, as well uh, in in our uh, model systems. Um, and then we're also looking to repurpose other approved drugs that uh, are known to uh, induce that differentiation, which we think is, is a major uh, reason why, why these uh, cells um, act that way. Uh, so getting them to differentiate into complete smooth muscle cells that no longer migrate into the, uh, into the lumen of the, the arteries. So um, that, that's really what I wanted to, to update you all on. Um, you know, I just want to acknowledge my my mentor, Dr. Milowitz, who's uh, who's our leader, and uh, um, as, as well as our our colleagues, uh, mainly Callie Quartler and Anita Ka, whose uh, whose work I, I showed here today. Um, and any uh, patients and families that are interested in uh, in participating in our research, you can uh, contact us at mac at uth.tmc.edu. So the MAC is the Multigeno Aortic Consortium that that uh, we we work under. Um, and, uh, and feel free to reach out to us. Um, and lastly, um, so the, the John Ritter Foundation, that's another foundation that, that does a lot of education and research towards, um, towards aortic, uh, genetic aortic disease. So they're looking for a couple of uh, volunteers uh, from families that are affected uh, by SMDS uh, to, join, to join them uh, uh, for their efforts. And uh, you can you know come up to me and ask me you know for their contact information. I didn't I wasn't able to add it here, but it's basically info at johnritterfoundation.org. Um, but you can come up to me afterwards. Um, I'll have a, some flyers if if you all want to take them uh, that has our contact information. But uh, and I'll be here all throughout the day and at dinner. So if you have any questions or follow up, uh, feel free to come up and and ask me. So uh, thank you again, and uh, you know I'll take your questions now. I have a question. I yeah. Yeah. Um, both uh, NR and the NAD are available as over-the-counter supplements, from what I understand. Can you comment on whether or not the dosages that you have been uh, experimenting with are higher dosages or would be similar to what they were on sort of over-the-counter medications? Right. Um, I mean, I can speak to that a little bit. What I do know is that the the... The dosages were uh, were fairly high in the in the, the mice compared to kind of what's been um, studied in humans, and so that's something that we're we're uh, exploring. We're we're trying to get what is the the right dose uh, to use, um, and uh, is is there is there a benefit to to increasing it uh, more towards what we're using in the in the mice, or or is kind of what's been used traditionally been uh, sufficient? So. Uh, so that's kind of part of you know we're we're getting the baseline data on on kind of the you know the more typical human dosages and seeing what kind of effects we get there and then we'll we'll design you know our our uh, clinical trials based off of that information. But that's that's a very good point. And my uh, follow up to that is from my reading, NR and NAD has some impacts on cholesterol, high blood pressure. They're also looking at it for Alzheimer's yeah. treatments. It has a range of therapeutic properties. Right. None of them, I guess, have been fully vetted. 
Right. Um, but have you seen any other beneficial uh, side effects? We we haven't, uh, but we haven't specifically looked uh, at those in in the these mice, and that's that's something that that we could potentially look for uh, more long term. We've mainly been focused on the the you know the the occlusion of these blood vessels as well as uh, um, the effect on the the aortic uh, disease. So, uh, but surely yes, th these are definitely things that that we'll be looking at more closely to see what are some of these other effects that could arise from NR treatment uh, in in our, our in our mice as well as in in uh, in humans. Yeah. I had a question. Yes. Thank you so much for that. Is it on or? <laughs> Thank you. That was a great presentation. Thank you. I had a question. Um, I understand that the sort of target of NR is to increase flow to the lumen. It doesn't really change the availability of the protein, of course. Um, and so you're still left with a contractility issue. And in the um, slide that you showed about uh, sort of effects of treatment in the mouse, I noticed that the um, uh, treated slide that you showed uh, still left after the effect of the NR, the uh, mouse, um, so yeah, there, uh, the, the treated NR still looks uh, misshapen and quite dilated. Oh. And so I was curious, even in your sort of best slide, what you would speak to about the consequences of, you know, a treated uh, sort of NR that still looks you know, misshapen and dilated as a consequence of not having proper contractility. Right. Yes. We, the honest answer is we don't know. We don't know if uh, what what effects the dilated blood vessel will will have. If there will be any negative effects, we we hope that it will not, uh, because we're we're really trying to to get it as open as possible uh, to to allow blood flow uh, through. Um, and so, you know, again, these are these are things that we'll be we'll be following uh, with more long term with with our mice models, um, and, and and looking at other uh, blood vessels as well. So, um, you know, we don't know. Um, you know, it does remain dilated, um, but at least it's open. And um, you know, so there, um, you know, it's perhaps it's not a you know complete resolution but uh but this might be kind of a complementary treatment you know to, to other things and you know this might be an important piece and you know if we can uh but we're really trying to improve the flow here and, and we think that this is a, a an encouraging you know sign but uh, but clearly there are other things that that we'll need to look at and, and make sure that we're not causing another problem by uh by using this do you want to go question online? <laughs> oh, question online. Yes, yes. Go ahead. So we have a question online. Does NR treatment primarily help to prevent or can it also help resolve blood vessels that have already been impacted? So that's a great question. I forgot to mention that. Uh, I, I wanted to. So so the answer is we we don't know yet, but but that is something that we are doing right now. So we so this uh, what we do here with the the injury model and these mice is uh, we give them the NR at the time of the carotid injury. Uh, so it 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 doesn't uh, it, it prevents the the formation of these these occlusions within those those uh, within the carotid artery. But what we don't know is that in in already occluded um, uh, cells or our already occluded vessels, if if we can then give NR at that time, and if that will help to resolve some of that uh, that accumulation, make those fibroblasts that are in the lumen already. Uh, leave. So that's something that we're that we're actively working on right now. Uh, but that's a very important question, and uh, and it's something that we're that we're addressing. We hope we hope that it will, uh, because again, we th what we think is happening is that these these smooth muscle cells are are becoming more differentiated, and so kind of no longer being that in that hyper hyper proliferative and migratory state, um, and and more in that uh, quiescent state. Um, and so you know, hopefully that uh, that will. Uh, make them leave and uh, open up those blood vessels. But we don't know, but it's something that we're, we're actively working on. I have a, a comment. Thank you so much. The The way that you walk us through uh, what's really happening. And and so you guys are very experts already, but thank you for doing that. It's gonna help every single presentation from now on. Sure. So thank you, Dr. Murdoch, for, for instructing us in such an amazing way. So. As you guys been hearing, there are different problems in different parts of the system. 
I think what is very important, they're trying to address one issue that is critical, that is associated with the strokes. And we are all going to be learning. And as you walk through the conference, the different parts of the disease and how a treatment may be focused to affect the smooth muscle cells and the ACTA2 dysfunction in different organs, in different things. Um, and what, one thing that they are trying to do, and he showed the data, is make sure it's not toxic. So in the process of doing this, we have a, to pay a price somewhere else. Uh, so that's going to be a theme, I think, throughout any research done in your disease. you got to focus somewhere because your disease is very complex. So you risk not being able to do any meaningful things. And you can think about the children that we know, the adults that we know, and how something like this could be very significant. Getting the gut to move may be very significant for some others. Getting the aorta from not dilating <laughs> is going to be significant. So I think incredible efforts. Um, also, the legacy that Dr. Middlewick in discovering the disease, making the community like all this stuff that is happening is, is literally her work and many, many, many others that she has recruited to this. So my thank yous to her. To her, to have you to come to the team uh, and to come here. Uh, she's currently at another research conference uh, where they put a consortium uh, to really go after all the aortic mutations and it's called the Duke Consortium. Um, I have a question about the clinical, if it's allowed, just briefly. Um, there is two months, it's quite a short amount of time as we know for any vessel to remodel, okay, to do anything. Um, is the intent to see if you have signal mostly in the plasma? And the second question associated with that is why CT? Is it going to be adult study? Is it going to be kids study? We try to use MRAs, sure. not CTs when we are doing exp exploratory stuff. Okay. And Yeah, so uh, so excellent questions. Um, so really the, the goal of the preclinical trial would be to, to get some baseline data. So not so much to prove uh, efficacy, but make sure that by... Um, by starting an R uh, that, that we're not causing any immediate toxicities um, and, and other potential problems. Um, so, um, so the imaging that we're going to be doing is uh, PET CT. So uh, not, not a full uh, CT scan, uh, but, but a PET CT. And, and so we have, uh, we, we have a, a patient with SMDS that, that actually had uh, exhibited increased uh, glucose uptake in the aorta um, and so uh, the, measured off of, of a PET scan. And so we're, we're seeing that, really we're trying to see if giving NR will reduce, if we can see a signal of reduced glucose uptake uh, off, of, off of the PET. Um, and, uh, and, you know, later, you know, after long-term treatment, then we can start to measure, you know, the sizes of the, of the, the vessels. Uh, but here we're, we're mainly looking at you know, do we see evidence of uh, of decreased glucose uptake when when we give NR because we're switching to oxfos, um, and then we're also doing blood work to actually measure some of those those levels of like NAD and, and other things uh, to see if if we give NR are we indeed uh, having a measurable increase of of those levels in the blood. So uh, so yes, um, you know, subsequent uh, full clinical the full, full clinical trial will will explore all of those other things you know, with long-term treatment of NR and these other therapeutics, but but this preclinical trial is, is going to be pretty limited and it's going to be for children. Um, and, uh, and it's just a small uh, handful that, that we're going to be uh, doing this, this preclinical trial just to get some baseline data. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Hi. Oh. Introduce yourself when you speak. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Uh, my name is Claire. I work with Dr. Mussolino in the lab. So I was wondering, since the premise of these molecules is obviously to change the metabolism, mm. is there any concern that it would also change the metabolism of other cell types? Yes, uh, sure. Uh, you know, off off target, you know, changes, uh, that, that is a, a concern. Um, and it's something that... Uh, um, you know, we'll, we'll be exploring, um, you know, uh, you know, some of these other, um, uh, medications that have been used like for cancer treatment to, to improve differentiation, you know, they can have, you know, off, off target effects as well. So, um, uh, so, you know, this, this treatment NR is, is pretty benign, um, you know, in the studies that we've looked at. So hopefully it won't have any, any major, uh, 
any you know uh, other metabolic effects. But uh, but yes, that is a potential concern, and it's something that that we're going to uh, is going to be a major part of of our you know studies going forward. So. Um, but yes, you know, we don't want to fix one thing and, and make something else worse. So, yeah, yeah, I guess it's kind of like a silly question to ask if you think no. there's side effects, because uh, obviously, yeah. um, but maybe just like to follow up, is there anything like specific you have in mind of like cell types you're really trying to like focus in on because you would be concerned? Um, yeah, not that I can think of right now. I mean, we're mainly focused on these, these uh, smooth muscle cells. Um, uh, but, um, you know, from, from the, the blood vessels, the, the aorta, you know, we're going to be, uh, you know, also trying to, to do cells and uh, studies on smooth muscle cells from the gut and bladder as well. Um, but, um, but, you know, I, uh, that's some, that's to be determined. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I don't have a great answer for you, uh, in that. I have that. compliments from there is probably ataxia kids that have significant right of disease. Right, yeah. That it's, it's, sorry, body Mussolini. <laughs> um, there, there have been a lot of trials on metabolic disorders, including mitochondrial diseases and Friedrich's ataxia, and mm. that have been very well tolerated. It didn't show an effect that was significant. That's why it's not part of the treatments as a recommendation. But the one thing that I think you could say is is going to be pretty safe. Mm -hmm. to expose anyone to right. NR um, right. with this condition. Always remember safety is about your particular body. <laughs> so you have to put the disease in question, but right. I, I feel comfortable saying that yeah. it will be safe. Yeah. And then, you know, the, the low carbohydrate, um, you know, depriving glucose, you know, the ketogenic diet has been, has been used for a long time for kids with seizures. Uh, you know, so, I mean, you know, we have some potential therapies uh, or approaches that we can use. And, and so uh, I think, I think the, um, I think all these results are very encouraging, and uh, but we do clearly have more work to do to make sure that it's safe um, uh, for these for these patients. Okay, thank you.